Hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Jonathan Pollock. Tonight we'll take a slightly belated look at some more films from winter of 2016, beginning with Zootopia. Much cleverer than its cutesy appearance suggests. Co-directed by Byron Howard and Rich Moore, the 55th animated feature in the Walt Disney Animated Classics catalog grossed nearly five times its $150 million budget only a month after its March 4, 2016 debut. In fact, its opening weekend is the third biggest for an original film and Disney Animation's best ever. In the titular city, populated by anthropomorphic mammals, a rookie bunny cop teams up with a fox con artist to solve a mysterious conspiracy involving disappearing animals. Ostensibly, the PG-rated picture is your classic buddy cop comedy, with a mismatched pair trying to solve a case before the end of the 108-minute runtime. The voice cast is stacked with excellent talent, which includes Jennifer Goodwin and Jason Bateman as our two leads, Idris Elba as a gruff police captain, J.K. Simmons as the lion mayor, Tommy Chong, Octavia Spencer, Jenny Slate, and Shakira as a singing gazelle. All of them predictably do a great job, but I need to single out Goodwin and Elba as the most memorable. The former brings an infectious amount of enthusiasm and emotion to her big-eared character, while the latter has an effortless delivery, like he's been doing cartoon work for years. They have a poignant exchange early when Goodwin confesses, I came here to make the world a better place, but I think I broke it. To which Elba replies, The world has always been broken. That's why we need good cops. Zootopia's oft-repeated mantra that anyone can be whatever you want is about as subtle as a bull in a china shop, or perhaps more appropriately, a fox in a hen house. It's a great, if familiar, message, but the movie really rings true when it examines themes regarding prejudice and stereotypes, and it's especially timely given our real-world climate. A universe populated exclusively by animals honestly seems like some furry's wet dream, but careful attention is paid to the mechanics of each creature's existence, like an entire miniature village populated exclusively by mice called Little Rodentia. Bon voyage, flatfoot! <laughs> Have a donut, Kappa! Ah! Oh my god, did you see those leopard print jeggings? No! Oh. oh! I love your hair. Oh, thank you. <laughs> While the brilliant animators at Disney may not quite be on the same level as their Pixar counterparts, they certainly give them a run for their money. The detail and imagination built into this four climate metropolis is fascinating, colorful, and packed with fun nods to other Disney properties. The faux camera work and digital rendering is especially impressive during the action sequences. The world building is rich and plentiful, but never quite takes full advantage, as the more effective adult-oriented jokes, like Sloss running the DMV, are few and far between. Speaking of Sloss, the pacing here moves along a bit too gingerly, even when Michael Giacchino's score keeps things upbeat and playful. An original pop song performed by Shakira called Try Everything closes out the film and is a very lively and catchy tune. With some can't-miss themes about pursuing your dream and standing up for yourself, this is a wonderful film all families will enjoy. It doesn't reach the pantheon of the studio's greatest efforts, but Zootopia is a fun, kid-friendly adventure with inspirational characters. Now let's check out some of your YouTube reviews. While only a few called this Disney's best, everyone agreed the messages and themes were on point, with scores averaging to an awesome. I thought this is a pretty great film, myself. Next up, 10 Cloverfield Lane. It may have a misleading name, but this is one captivating movie. The $15 million science fiction psychological thriller by Dan Trachtenberg, in his directorial debut, premiered in March of 2016, where it grossed over $50 million in profit. Despite some of the bigger names attached to the project, 10 Cloverfield Lane was impressively produced almost entirely in secret. It wasn't until a teaser trailer released just two months before its premiere that anyone even knew the film existed. In the modern era of leaked scripts, production photos, casting announcements, and spoiler chatter, what the Bad Robot production team did here has to be applauded. After being rescued in a car accident, Mary Elizabeth Winstead is brought to an underground shelter where her host, John Goodman, claims the outside world is affected by a widespread chemical attack. The only other character of note is John Gallagher Jr., who portrays a slightly timid fellow guest in the survival bunker. Winstead is fantastic at balancing her fear with strength and resolve, and some of the film's most effective moments is when she's brainstorming a possible escape. Goodman is the real highlight of the film, though, giving depth and purpose to his frightening but tortured character. He defends his doomsday preparedness by citing, Crazy is building your ark after the flood has already come. There's a real sadness behind his eyes, but also anger and rage. It's early in the year, but I predict he'll score plenty of nominations come award season. There's been an attack, a big one. 
I'm not sure yet if it's chemical or nuclear, but down here we're safe. I was driving north of here. You were in an accident. This saved your life, Michelle. Thank you so much for saving my life. I, I guess I should, I should go to a hospital now. You can't leave. Their caregiver captor relationship exhibits lots of favorable similarities to the 1990 Stephen King adaptation, Misery. Like when Winston must hardly hide evidence of her betrayal before Goodman can open the door. This is a perfectly paced film that's conventionally shot and edited to really maximize tension. It's also an emotional experience that constantly keeps you guessing. Is Goodman being truthful about the lethal conditions outside the bunker, or is he just a kidnapper desperate for company? Thankfully, Trachtenberg doesn't shy away from delivering very specific answers to these questions in the exciting final moments of the film. Besides his awesome work on the rebooted Battlestar Galactica TV series, the immensely talented Beer McCreary is often relegated to lower budget, smaller profile films like Everly or the Angry Video Game Nerd movie. But his work here should hopefully help elevate his profile. The score for 10 Cloverfield Lane is tense and unnerving, keeping the viewer in an appropriate state of discomfort throughout the 103 minute film. The picture's most obvious disappointment is its tangential relationship to the 2008 found footage horror film Cloverfield. To be honest, the PG-13 rated movie barely qualifies as the spiritual successor it was advertised as, which, if we're being fair, is a criticism of the title and marketing rather than the film itself. Indeed, this script, penned by Josh Campbell and Mart Stukin, was initially authored as an original standalone story, before producers, including J.J. Abrams, noticed the similarities to the aforementioned horror film and retroactively positioned the production as a sister film. So if you're able to overlook this tenuous connection, 10 Cloverfield Lane delivers solid thrills in a gripping and claustrophobic study of mysterious characters and motivations. Now let's see what you had to say about it. A suspenseful story with incredible performances, we both scored this a great. Finally, my very detailed thoughts on Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. Amongst the clutter, there's actually an enjoyable movie here. Zack Snyder returns as director for the second installment in DC Comics' cinematic universe. Despite an onslaught of unfavorable early reviews, the $250 million film soared to a box office cum of half a billion just a week after its March 25, 2016 release. Worried about Superman's potential for evil and manipulated by criminal psychopath Lex Luthor, Batman sets out to destroy the son of Krypton as mankind wrestles with what type of hero it really needs. Ben Affleck may be the umpteenth person to portray the Dark Knight, but his gruff, buff, and unforgiving portrayal of the character is among the best. And physically speaking, his chiseled physique and 8% body mass help him look closer to the Cape Crusader than all previous live-action players. I'm not sure we needed to see Bruce Wayne's parents get murdered yet again, but at least the treatment seems faithful and respectful to the crime vigilante. Henry Cavill returns as the Man of Steel, and while he's still a far cry from the warmth of Christopher Reeves, he is convincing enough as the misunderstood alien hero. Notably, the PG-13 rated film includes the live-action debut of Wonder Woman, portrayed here in a criminally abbreviated appearance she has only 16 lines total, by the gorgeous Gal Gadot. She exudes the confidence and skill necessary to make this underexplained character work, and despite my initial hesitation, seems like a great fit. Jesse Eisenberg plays a very Jesse Eisenberg-like version of Superman's arch-enemy, delivering plenty of devilish and awkward monologues. The film also features performances, in descending importance, from Amy Adams, Diane Lane, Lawrence Fishburne, Jeremy Irons, Holly Hunter, Scoot McNary, Harry Lennox, Kevin Costner, and the cold dead corpse of Michael Shannon. One of my chief criticisms of the previous film was the wanton destruction and deaths of innocent civilians. Snyder was less concerned with how it felt and more concerned with how it looked. In a thinly veiled attempt to retcon those poor decisions, Batman v Superman begins by showing the earlier film's carnage from a parallel perspective, and leveraging it into a catalyst for this movie. I don't for a second believe it was planned, but it's an effective way to address, and perhaps even retroactively correct, Man of Steel's biggest flaw. With that in mind, Snyder makes extra sure, with three separate, plainly spoken lines of dialogue, that all of the destruction in this movie happens in uninhabited or abandoned areas of the city. As the screenplay silently suggests, are you happy now? Speaking of violence, the titular fight is a real showstopper, and everything fans have wanted to see for years. A truly captivating live-action bout between Gotham's Bat and Kal-El. Borrowing choreography from the Arkham Knight video games, this centerpiece battle is well shot and easy to follow. Seeing Soup's unlimited power finally being tested by Batfleck's impressive arsenal of gadgets is worth the price of admission alone. Stay down! If I wanted it, you'd be dead already!
Prior to their duel, the Dark Knight taunts his alien adversary by asking, Tell me, do you bleed? Continuing after a dramatic pause, you will. The way in which their duel resolves itself, however, is an extraordinarily silly deus machina. BVS DOJ is a dark film, and I don't just mean thematically. Nearly the entire picture is poorly lit and desaturated. The score, composed by both Hans Zimmer and Junkie XL, takes some interesting guitar-influenced turns during the picture's gritty climax, but never quite stands out. Following the finale, the bloated film continues to slog on with a seemingly never-ending coda, which drops even more hints to future sequels. The film's two main characters aren't simply comic book icons, but icons of the 20th century, rebooted, reimagined, remade dozens and dozens of times since their inception almost 80 years ago. But like it or not, Warner Bros. is hell-bent on restarting them yet again, forcing audiences to sit through lots of tedious world-building. Like a totally distracting and shoehorned sequence where Godot just watches video clips of future characters. For crying out loud, Cyborg isn't even slated to get his own picture for another four years. DC Comics definitely has the better and more popular characters, but for the last 10 years it's Marvel who has produced the better and more popular films. Caught with their proverbial pants down, DC has gone on the offensive, frantically playing catch-up in the shared universe game. So instead of carefully plotting out a series of origin films introducing us to each character, writers Chris Terrio and David S. Goyer overloaded seven of them into the same movie. I mean, is this a Batman movie, a Superman movie, or a Justice League movie? Because the title literally mentions all three. DC Entertainment has such a hard-on for crafting this new multi-picture franchise they forgot the rules of fundamental storytelling. But if you remove all the distracting Justice League Wonder Woman elements and pare down the first hour considerably, there is actually an interesting story buried within. But even with its extremely generous two and a half hour runtime, this washed out film feels choppy and unfinished. For better or worse though, audiences don't seem to care, as Dawn of Justice set the record for biggest opening weekend of any superhero film. Perhaps the huge slate of upcoming DC features will settle down and stay more focused, but I'm honestly no longer excited for any of them. I will say, however, that if rumors about Affleck directing his own solo Batman movie are true, I would be there on opening night. Dealing with trust and intentions, this picture examines how famous heroes deal with real adversity, and it gets a few things right in that department. Comic book fans will probably enjoy this on at least one viewing, but its divisive reputation is unfortunately well earned. Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice is a detrimentally ambitious mess void of charm or cohesion, but it somehow delivers some exciting action. Now that I'm finished with the longest review in movie night history, let's review some of your thoughts. Applauding Affleck's performance, but not much else, you scored this a 7 out of 10. My heart may have enjoyed this, but my mind didn't. I can only score Batman v Superman a good. Unfortunately, that does it for tonight's episode, but next week we'll be traveling to Alcatraz, so if you've seen these movies, please leave your reviews as a comment below. And if you click this information icon, some related content will slide out for you to watch. Once again, my name is Jonathan Paula. Thank you for watching, and have a good movie night. Music